and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have my good brother as always, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. We, it is Friday night. You know what that means. Yes. And, so this is it is it warms it warms my heart when I see, when I see when I see that the developer of our of this little project is looking forward to Friday nights as much as we are. I I I actually at one point had to ask the monk, are we by some graciousness of Satan suddenly becoming influential? Influential, yes. Influencers, hell fucking no. I didn't say that one. You just said that one. And why would you bring that curse upon us? I am of the opinion that we need, that we need to keep ourselves grounded. And the best way of to course. do that, the best way to learn from life's pitfalls is to watch other people fall in them. A smart man learns from his own mistakes. A wise man learns from the mistakes of others. So, last time around, we covered the Field Knight, which could be described as an extremely aggressive tank. It's the Demo Knight in all but name. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, the dem, it's the Demo Knight with a bit of Kamen Rider Forze with rockets. I love the fact that we can actually bring Kamen Rider into this, because now I need to make a Kamen Rider Forze Field Knight XP. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just looking... Just when it comes to when it comes to some of the rocket stuff, I keep thinking of the of Forze's rockets. Yeah, yeah. No, I get that. <laughs> I I I absolutely get that, and I want it. And now I have to make a like I said a Forze XP mm -hmm. as a field date. Yeah, but as much as we've made two fort jokes with the last few classes, um. For the next one in our in our run through of the classes of Veil of the Void, I think that trend is going to be on hold for a bit. No, instead we're tra instead we're trading two fort for Diablo. <laughs> <laughs> because what we have what we have this week is known as the Mechromancer. Mechromancer. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong game. <laughs> uh. For all of you out there, that's the, the I think the third time we've probably made a Techromancer joke. Go play Techromancer. You will not you will not um blame us for how much fun you're having. Mm. You'll thank us. And I've always I will admit, the concept of a heroic necromancer is something that I've always found interesting. Because there's the assumption that somebody who's that who's that close to messing around with death has to has to be villainous. Oh, I've o I've always been, I've always been of the approach that that can cer that can certainly be done. I'd say a, I'd say a big reason that that ki that that kind of thing happens is partially the fault of Tolkien. Yeah, um, I can definitely see the whole alignment with death being uh, um conflated with an alignment to evil. Because uh, Tolkienism, uh, Tolkienism's with darkness and light and life and death and so on. Mm -hmm. But once you once you move, I I I can't even say once you move once you move out of out of Europe that that, that doesn't seem to, that doesn't happen because there's plenty of, there's plenty of cultures even within Europe where you where um, you could do something necromancer adja adjacent and not be villainous. Well, I mean, there's. Literally all of Grecian mythos where death is venerated mm -hmm. because the Greeks had a very, uh, very big respect for death. There's, um, I f there's also the fact that um, Hades, in the vast majority of Greek myths that he's in, is not necessarily evil. At worst, he's indifferent. He's... Oh, and I think part of that has to do with the fact that Zeus is like, okay, you're going to be king of the underworld, and Hades is like, God damn it, brother. <laughs> I, I, I firmly believe, 
um, to this day in one of the many different interpretations of the uh, Rape of Persephone that you hear of. That is one of um, conspiracy between Persephone and Hades to get her away from Demeter rather than Hades actually stealing Persephone. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's as many interpretations of mythos as there are ages in Grecian lore, all the way from the Mykonians to, well, their fall and Rome's rise. Mm -hmm. So take that with a grain of salt. (laughs) And one of one of my there's one of my favorite um, deities to associate with whenever I'd play clerics or paladins was the Raven Queen, mm-hmm. who is essentially D, essentially D and D's D and D's version of Morrigan. Yeah, very anti. Uh, she's also very very anti undead. Which which certainly certainly makes it it makes more sense to to do to do turn on dead with that kind of setup than to just have it be something that you have no matter what. Like why, yeah, because why would why would Cord get? I know I bring this up a lot, but why would Cord, for example, give a fuck about undead? He would only give a fuck in the fact that there's something for you to overcome. That's about it. Yeah, but that's weak. Cuz you could say Yeah, I know. You could say that about literally any of the go- any of the good or neutral deities. Well, and with Cord specifically, you could say that with just about anything that you come in conflict with. Mm-hmm. So, Cord it's an even weaker excuse. Oh. And when, when it but um and even, and of course of course i of course even the, even though tite kubo owes zan money um the concept of the Sh- of the shinigami as pre- as presented in the early run of bleach is something worth exploring kubo had better pay me one day um I'll, if i can't, i'll if, come i'll come and get my pound of flesh one day if i can't use that example consider the presence of the water dragon in Jade Empire. Yeah. And the fact that the cycle is essentially broken is what is putting things out of balance so much. Yes, absolutely. The the balance that is struck by death and life is not one that needs to be conflated with good or evil. The, I think for a lot of people, the most famous video game pre- presentation of the necromancer is the one in Dia- is one in Diablo, specifically Diablo Two. Mm-hmm. And from what I recall, lore-wise, oh, though it's been it's been a while, necromancers were priests of a of a go- of a god of death. And not o- not only that, not only that, but just consider th- just consider the numerous um funeral rites and rituals to to the point where that's a, to the point where that's a career whether it be a whether it be a mortician or back, or back in the old days a undertaker mhm and of course though we don't have as much insight into certain mythoses um the the rites of death in many different cultures across all of the world are still ones of veneration and peaceful travel, I guess is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. And there's been, there's been plenty of, there's been plenty of campaigns that I've done over the years where um, a necromancer or or something similar was was it was more of an exorcist in terms of what they did which makes sense um a necromancer i guess the best way to put it the traditional site of the evil necromancer or as traditional as that site is is someone perverting the bonds of nature 
they're going again counter to the grain but necromancy in general doesn't have to be that way no now one might ask why we're bringing all this up when it comes to the idea of a, of the macromancer because they're not exactly the same there's a there's a similar there's a similar association with death that I th- I think wa- I think warrants the exploration into a heroic necromancer, um, and inc- incidentally, um, one of my old characters, Tenebris, who wh- who was technically was technically a necromancer, I had I had a bit of a gag where he instead of keeping a bunch of skeletons around his pets, he just kept one well preserved um, ca- cadaver as his personal butler. Mm-hmm. Because an undead version of Alfred or no- or Norman from Big O was appealing to me. That's not surprising. <laughs> They're both good characters. Mm-hmm. Oh, but with 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 that re- with that preamble out of the way, let's get let's dive into the nitty gritty of things, and. We've kind of, we've kind of skipped over some we've kind of skipped over the blurbs, but I think with the necromancer we kind of have to go over this. Okay. Because, uh, and I'm not going to go into the into the one page quote. We're not doing that. But I do mm-hmm. want to go. I do want to go into what's stated afterwards. Yeah. Escape has always influenced our world. You see it manifest in battlefields as death weakens the veil. You feel it in the cold of night when a shiver runs down your spine as the creaking hallways echo. When confronted with this force, you have two choices. Face it, or flee from it. Mechromancers prefer to face this force head-on, embracing it. Certain people called to walk the path of the dead have experienced death in its potent form. Only the strongest can take on this challenge. When one answers the call, they travel to a place where the veil is thin. Many take a pilgrimage to the dead planet of Drokan, located on the edge of the Shadow Scar. Upon That's reaching... Dro- Drokran. Drokran. Upon reaching their destination, all manner of ethereal energy and creatures attack. The energy begins overwhelming the novice, attacking their connection to the arcane. During this trial, there are but two outcomes, death or control. Should energy consume the novice, they die. Powerful magic then corrupts their husk, forming a vessel for all manner of ethereal creature. Should they gain control, the ethereal magic binds to their connection and newfound vitality flows. From there, they craft a weapon of power, an item bound to their very soul. Resting between the hilt and handle is a rune of death, formed from tech steel infused with ether crystals. This rune allows the Mechromancer to manipulate the life essence of the recently passed. See, when I first saw the name Mechromancer, I didn't quite make the co- co- connection till we got to the actual character page. I was like, God damn it! Last time... It was a. Uh, mm-hmm. <sighs> was one of those realizations of I should have seen this coming sooner. Yep, I should note that we're that we're breaking new ground with this class because this is our first casting class. Yep, yep. So, first we start off with proficiencies with weapons. They're proficient with great melee weapons, swords, and archaic weapons. They're um, heavy and medium armor and. Essence grenades. <laughs> um, and just just the fact that we just the fact that we have a a a, a necromancer who can wear heavy armor uh, uh, makes me smile. So we're not dealing with the stereotype of the fr- of the frail guy. Well, I mean, not only is it you know heavy armor, but the very first we- me- weapon proficiency is great melee weapons. And the weapons are not in alphabetical order. It's great melee weapons, swords, and then archaic weapons. If it had been in alphabetical order, archaic weapons would have been first. This implies to me, at least a little bit, that part of the archetypical archetypal uh, necromancer in his head when he first wrote that weapon proficiency section was guy in heavy armor wielding big sword also raising the dead. (laughs) Arthas, is that you? The Lich King. You're right. Fuck. So, uh, when 
when you level up, add 1d6 plus 1d3 plus vitality, or 5 plus vitality to your max HP. So, pretty standard. Starting items. A sonic saber or a great melee weapon. Synthetic medium armor. Star um, 5d6 times 1000 in starting SC. 5 essence grenades. And either occult or ether workings. And hmm. it, it looks like and um we have a new column when it comes to when it comes to the upgrade chart and that is um spells which we'll be which we'll be getting into when the time comes. Mm hmm So then we start with our first level abilities. First is Arcanting. Your primary arcane casting virtue is power. You gain plus one in the arcanting skill. You may learn the unique you may learn the unique spells from the Ether Tree. You know four novice spells at character creation and two spells from the Mystic Spell Tree. Then we have nice. Death Charge. Once per short rest when a creature dies, you may cast a known or unknown non superlative ether spell of your level for free. That's a good that's a good way to make use out of mooks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, and Soul Devour. Your starting weapons are devouring weapons that consume the life essence of fallen beings around you. This weapon makes no distinction between friend or foe. It will, de it will devour any essence while it is wielded. Once per round, when a being dies within 20 squares of you, regardless of who killed it, you gain a set amount of soul essence from them. How much you gain is based on what died. Average, give one. Strong, give two. Overwhelming and premium refill fully. How much essence you can contain and the effect they have on the battlefield are determined by the weapon you use. These effects also level up at levels 1, 5, 10, and 15. If you find additional weapons, you may transform them into devouring weapons if you spend at least 6 hours of rest modifying the weapon and then feed it essence. You may choose to expend all consumed essence in a weapon as an extra action. Raziel, is that you? Um, maybe. I'm just, th I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking of Raziel devouring souls. And then we have. Yeah, but he devoured them into himself. Mm -hmm. So, but this is, but this is the Soul Reaver. So I'm technically correct. The best kind of correct. <laughs> So, <clears throat> what you can do with essence depend seems to depend on the type of weapon. Great melee mm -hmm. weapons can hold up can hold six, nine, twelve, or eighteen essence at any one time, depending on level. Every three essence grants an additional two damage. You may choose ah! to release your max stored souls as a blast of necrotic ether energy around you. If you do so, deal three times essence and ether damage to all beings. Excluding yourself in a five by five area centered on you, which <laughs> okay at fifteenth level at fifteenth level if you had max essence that is fifty four damage to every to everything within twenty five feet. Yep, <clears throat> twenty five foot square around you. Let's see, for single-handed, you hold up to two, three, four, or six essence at any one time. Every two essence within the weapon lets you add pl lets you add plus one pip to an attack die with that weapon once per round. You may consume the max essence to gain a combat bonus. If dual wielding, choose which weapon. Your next attack made with that weapon automatically hits the foe, and the attack explodes in a necrotic blast, inflicting all adjacent adversaries with weapon plus three times essence in physical and ether damage. Nice. Um, Small square around you, and uh, everybody gets hit with both essence and physical. Um, question that question that I feel needs to be clarified, and this is a minor thing. Um, since it mentions um, every two essence that's within the weapon, does the same thing apply with great melee weapons? I'm assuming it does. Um, you mean? Uh, 
for the great melee's weapons, every three essence grants an additional two damage. Yes. Yes, I would assume as much. Mm -hmm. So that and that's single-handed melee or ranged, which <laughs> would which um would me would make would mean that you'd have some you'd have um some for ranged attack you could do ra you could do some interesting bombing mu runs. Yeah, and. I think when it says a necrotic blast inflicting all adjacent adversaries, I think it means adjacent adversaries to the foe that you've hit. So a, a um a, a all squares around them. So within a within a what is essentially a three by three square centered on them. So see that guy over there? Fuck him and everyone around him. Yeah, if they're standing around in a close pack. Uh, they're kind of fucked. Then we have two-handed ranged. Your ranged weapon may hold three, four, five, or six essence. Every two essence grants an additional plus five squares of short or long range. At no, max short and long range. Short five long squares range. to both to both limits. Yep. At max essence, you inflict plus power in acidic damage. You may expend max souls to launch a volley of necrotic ether energy at adversaries within the weapon's short range equal to the number of soul essence expended, deal two times power to all targeted adversaries. Here's the wait, real wait. fuck all of you kind of maneuver. No, what this is, what this is, Monk, this is a sniper who gets longer sniper with more soul essence, does acid damage, and then can shoot micro-missiles at short range. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. That's... You may expend max souls, so you have up to six essence at, at level 15. So let's say we're using that. To launch a volley of necrotic ether energy at adversaries, adversaries within the short range equal to the number of soul essence expended. That's six necrotic ether energy blasts within the short range that all deal uh, two times power to the targeted adversaries. It's micro-missiles. It's fucking micro-missiles. <laughs> Doom had an assault rifle that had that had a micro missile attachment. Yes, this is the same thing. This is a this is a sniper rifle with micro missile attachments. You could turn the, the assault rifle into a precision rifle and with micro missiles. Mm -hmm. So you can literally do Doom Doom Eternal with this gun. Yep. Um, Which is fitting considering he's in hell. Yep. So at level t at level two, you gain you gain spark of life. As an action, you may consume two souls within your weapon to infuse your Mecrotech cube. You may then throw the cube, summoning a half mechanical, half undead spirit inf infested in the landing spot, and we get our first um, spell entry. And as an aside, these were all made into cards, which I have that in a full-on deck. Spirit infested, humanoid, mecha, undead, average. Then it gives the stat block for the thing. Armor, ability based, HP 30, move 5. Does one attack that can either be ether pistol or bash. And then skills hunting, muscle, and weapons. Along and on the left hand side, it has its virtues of power 4, finesse 5, vitality 4, mentality 1, judgment 1, and charisma 1. Mm -hmm. Um. What was once yours is is its first ability. When summoned, gain the armor stats of a recently slain creature. If chosen by the GM as an adversary, roll 1d3 to determine their armor level. Um, strength and strength in numbers. While at least three allied spirit infested are on the battlefield, their damage is increased by four. Every unit past three increases damage by an additional four to a max of 12. This really is the... this. This really is the Diablo Necromancer with that. Mm-hmm. And since that's pretty much what that th what that guy would do to murder your frame rate. Summon all the skeletons. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we have Undead Domination. You may have three undead units, spirit infested, wraiths, etc., in play under your control at one time. And controlled undead gain your vitality virtue and additional HP. And you get an extra skill point. Like at every second level. Mm -hmm. Or every even level, I should say. At level three, you gain Ethereal Garb, and this is a not and this is a non-exclusive. 
The ether swirls invisibly around you, distracting and absorbing attacks from adversaries. When you are attacked, adversaries roll with minus one bonus die. At level ten, this is minus two. Eh. You thought you hit me, but you didn't. Yep. See, at that point, that's where I'd say, Raziel, shift it to the ethereal plane, fuck you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> at level four, you gain advantage <clears throat> in training. We've covered how that works, so I'm not going to repeat myself there. At level five, you gain a spell upgrade. You may now cast your spells at apprentice level and gain an additional spell. You also gain your, fir you also gain your specialization. We have we ha we actually have four this no we have three this time, spirit commander, wraith lord, and ether cyst. At um, go ahead. Something I do want to point out um, is that there was also in that spell column in the original um, list, it just says plus one spell at level two, plus one spell at level four. I think this is plus one to the number of spells you can just cast. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. We'll find out later. Oh, at level 6, you gain Essence Empower. As a free action, after successfully casting a spell, you may consume a Soul Essence and enhance the spell's damage and duration by 1d6 for one, or one round res and one round respectively. That's, uh... That's nice. Mm -hmm. I have some soul essence. I want to make this either more powerful or last longer. Yep. Here, soul, empower it. At level 7, you gain advancement training. At level 8, you gain explosive decay. When a unit dies around you, you may choose to overload the body as a reaction. If you do so, the life essence inside explodes and deals 15 plus power ether damage to all beings in a 5x5 five five radius around it. Using this ability destroys the essence it would give two round cooldown. So at this point, you can, if, you're, if your weapon's full and you don't need that and you just want to kill, you've, you've killed something in the middle of a pack of things, now it's time for you all to die. Boom. <laughs> I love this. Uh, yep. At level 9, you gain... Macabre Recharge. The magic of the Aether Realm can be controlled through the usage of your own life force. Once per long rest, you may sacrifice 20% HP to reduce all allied Aether Charge states by 9. <laughs> at 10th... At, and that's a non-exclusive. Yeah. At tenth level, you gain, you gain more, you gain additional abilities with your specialization and spell upgrade. You may now cast your spells at a depth level and gain an additional spell. At level eleven, you gain advancement training. At level twelve, you gain leeching strike, which is non-exclusive. The adversary's pain is your gain. I see what you did there. No pain, no gain. Yeah. Your pain, my gain. Mm -hmm. Once per round, when you roll two fours on a successful attack, you may leech two times vitality and HP from the adversary. This may heal you three times per long rest. I love lifelink. Mm -hmm. You also gain nano regeneration. As an extra action twice per short rest, you unleash nanobots to heal all party members and minions in earshot by two times vitality in HP. Neither of these is exclusive. Mm -hmm. Let's see. At level 13, you gain Call of the Grave. As the adversary gets closer to entering the realm of death, your strikes grow more vicious. Once an adversary is below half health, you critically succeed with one less hit. You may only crit this way in the same adversary once every round. <laughs> That's... That brings a tear to my evil eye. <laughs> <sighs> uh, 
At level 14, you gain uh. advancement training. At level 15, you gain spell upgrade. You can now cast your spells at Magus level and gain an additional spell. You also gain your next step on your specialization. At level 16, you gain Fear of Death, which is non-exclusive. You emit a Fearful Aura. You gain plus two bonus levels in the skill Intimidation. Twice per short rest, if you successfully intimidate someone, you may inflict the conditions Fear and Poison. Once per short rest, with, if, used by a if used by a Necromancer, gain plus one Soul Essence. <laughs> you intimidate them and steal a part of their soul. Good job! At level 17, you gain advancement training. At level 18, you gain Nanomancer, which is also non-exclusive. Your strikes now infest your target with nanobots. The nanobots inflict six electrical damage each round for five rounds to your target. The same target may only be affected by this once per round. You have... <laughs> You have you have free you have free dots. So only a once per combat dot, but still a once per combat per target per combat. Which which um make which makes which makes the sniper possibility we talked about earlier all the more insidious. Mm-hmm. Especially especially if that sniper is also is also a Necromancer, so you combine that with Explosive Decay. Mm hmm Oh. At level 19, you gain Soul Casting. You may use Essence to cast up to three spells per f for free per day. Using one Essence casts a Novice spell. Two Essence casts an Apprentice spell. Three Essence casts an Adept spell. Jesus. You also gain spell mastery, so now you can you gain access to the ether superlative spells. That's at level twenty, monk. At level level twenty, sorry. And you also gain specialization. You gain the final ability from your specialization. And then your capstone, death's chosen, the ultimate. You bend this realm to your will to the point where even death has taken notice. You add a permanent plus one to your power. This may bring you above nine. Your devouring weapons hold an additional plus two essence. Your summoned units add your power virtue to their damage, and you may control an additional undead. <laughs> um, did you ever did you ever play champ Did you ever play Champions of Norath? I did. I'm getting Shadow Knight vibes. Just a tad. Would that also? Now the the question is: Would this also give me vibes to the Dark Knight in Final Fantasy? Mm. Not quite. Not really. I mean, in in, ter in terms of in terms of looks, maybe the FF14 Dark Knight, but the whole the whole thing with the Dark Knight in say FF14 is he hates he hates magic users. I eat your magic and kill you with it. As far as the Reaper. A little bit closer, but not exactly. No, the re the Reaper is a little different too. This is this is definitely le as as you mentioned earlier in the realm of the Diablo two Necromancer or the Norath uh, Shadow Knight. Mm -hmm. And hold on one moment. And we're back. Um, before we get into the subclasses, since this is our first casting class. There is one little bit of house cleaning we need to do first, and Zan, I'll let you take the wheel with this. Okay. So, we actually haven't gone over the arcane rules, which are the rules of magic and spellcasting in Veil of the Void. Uh, so, starting at the beginning of the section about arcane rules, uh, I'm going to try and go through this as quick and dirty as possible, hit the actual rules portions without reading too much between so it first has a breakdown of spell sheets uh, in the example it shows that there's an example spell description a difficulty a range which is both the range of how far it can be cast and if it has an area how big the area field is a duration which can either be instant if it's an instant cast spell or how long it takes to channel if it's a channeled spell the cooldown and then the description of its effects um 
the difficulty specifically is really important here because it indicates what has to be made for a successful role for that cast with an arcanting check. Um, there's also an important rule here. The same spell cannot be cast on the same target already under the effects of the spell. So if the spell has any effects beyond damage, uh, something that lasts like a dot or anything of that nature, or a field that they're already in, you can't cast it on them again. Um, the cooldown obviously is, like anything else, how long the spell takes to recharge until you can cast it again. And then it indicates range. Um, the range is pretty self-explanatory. It's all in squares. Um, and with area spells, you choose the center square when you choose how far you're shooting it, and then it creates the area around that. Seems seems pretty straightforward, um, but there's also area spells that are cones and lines. Um, it says, first of all, a cone or line area field cannot be used diagonally. It has to be used in one of the four cardinal directions. And the origin square is always one square in front of the caster. So it's it's the, the caster, and then the origin square is the next square in front of them. Uh, so another requirement, you can't cast and dual wield at the same time. So you do have to have a weapon free. Kind of remind you of H&H's spell focuses in that regard. Mm -hmm. And then magic is multi-realm. Um, meaning that there are four realms that produce magic and each spell tree has its own style. Um, casters may learn spells from any spell tree except for the Natura tree. Only naturalists have a strong enough bond with the Adareth realm to use its magic. The default spell trees of each class are as follows. Uh, Thaumatech gets Arcane, which is your four Hellenistic elements of air, earth, fire, and water. Naturalists get Natura, Mimics get Reflection, Mecromancers get Ether. And then, of course, there are spells in any of the trees with an asterisk in them, and that's only the class that it's under can learn that spell. Uh, so those are basically the unique spells to the trees that are unique to the actual casting class. So any any class in the, any uh, spell in the Ether tree, for example, which is the tree we'll be reading later... Uh, that has an asterisk, is unique to the Mecromancer, and only the Mecromancer can cast those. Um, spell leveling, we kind of went over. Level 1 is Novice spells, level 5 is Apprentice spells, level 10 is Adept spells, 15 is Magus, and Superlative spells are only gained at level 20, and only if you're using an Arcanting class. You can't get Superlative spells if you are not the class. They are unique to the class. Um, uh, as a... Uh, there's, then there's that, we saw that thing about ether charge states earlier. Um, and the charge state's actually pretty important as a, as a rule. Um, and I'll read this one out a little bit more. All realm magic energy travels through the arcane current. Most mortal beings have at least a small connection to this current. Magic users, known as mages or casters, learn to manipulate this energy to cast spells. As they cast spells, they collect realm energy inside of them, making it more difficult to cast. This is represented by the charge state. Each Arcanter has their own charge state for every realm, with a total of 12 points in each. Each spell successfully cast from some realm adds a point to its respective realm's charge state. After six points have been added to the same charge state, the overcharged effect takes place on all spells cast from the overcharged realm until reduced below six again. And what Overcharge does increases spell cooldowns by two by plus two rounds, or double time-based spell cooldowns. So if it's like 10 minutes, it's now 20. It adds one to spell difficulty, and you get minus one bonus die on spell arcanting checks cast from the same realm. The Overcharged effect does not prevent you from continually casting spells. It simply makes it more difficult to do. It lasts until the charge state is reduced to six and below. It takes a long rest to fully reduce all realm charge states to zero. A short rest reduces realm charge states by six. Mystic spells and spells with no cooldown or difficulty do not add to charge state. Um, there's critical spell failure. Uh, when a spell fails critical, it goes out of control. You roll 2d6 and measure the distance in squares from 
the player that had the critical fail. The spell then manifests as a chaotic rift. Based on the spell level, all beings in either 3x3 for novice, 5x5 for... uh, I think next one was Apprentice. Yeah, Apprentice. 7x7 for Adept and 9x9 for Magus. Area, take 5, 15, 25, or 35 chaotic damage. Each round after, the area field expands by 1 to a maximum of 13 by 13 moves 1d6 squares towards a random mage, and deals the 5, 15, 25, or 35 chaotic damage again. And then the out-of-control spell will end after 3, 6, 9, or 15 rounds, depending on whether it's Novice Apprentice out after Magus. A spell that is out of control can be cancelled if you succeed, succeed a tough 5 Arcanting check. If a superlative spell fails, so the top 20th level spell level stuff, it will go out of control regardless of critical failure. The failed spell appears as a 25 by 25 square area field on top of the caster. All beings inside the area take 50 chaotic damage. An out of control superlative spell cannot be canceled and lasts for 20 rounds. And then, uh, with the with the charge states, um, if a realm's charge state has hit its maximum of twelve points, it reaches the dangerous cast point. At this point, any additional spells cast from the same realm spell tree are considered to have critically failed on a standard failure. On a naturally rolled critical fail, the spell opens up a tear in the void, dealing 20% of the character's max HP in chaotic damage to all beings in a 7x7 area field centered on the caster. So there there are some things here that are really important within uh, within the, uh, this, the, the arcane rules that we kind of glossed over. Now, there's all... Oh, go ahead. Before you get into that last point, a few things to take away. One, this is a way to do gishes easily, but also provide some drawbacks when it comes to gishes that aren't just traps. Mm -hmm. The problem that we've had with gishes, and the reason why the Inquisitor is your favorite class in Heavens and Heresies, is (laughs) the fact that when we've... The fantasy of the Gish is one is one that is is one that is very prevalent among popular culture. The the if if somebody needs a more recent case in point, look at The Witcher. Yep, Geralt definitely is, a Gish. Geralt is a is a Gish if I ever saw one. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also pl- there's plenty of char- there's plenty of characters within within anime that could be within anime alone. That could be considered gishes. There's plenty of characters in single character RP- RPGs, action RPGs, and so on. That could be considered some sort of gish. As much Bayonetta, as- anybody? <laughs> um, we look, we hear, we, hell, Jedi could be considered a gish. <laughs> No, Je- Jedi are a gish. They are space wizards using laser swords. As space well, sorcerers, they don't have a spellbook to memorize from. And while some, <laughs> while, some of, while some Jedi might lean what might lean in one direction or the other, the image that people have when it comes to the Jedi, it, even at it, even at its most fighty, is still a gish. Mm-hmm. And the reason I point out all of these fantasies is that when that is something that's so prevalent in in geek culture, people are going to want to carry that over into the, into their tabletop games. And G- gish is fun. And more often than not, gish trying to do a gish in in certain popular games is a road filled with traps. Because 
or in so, or in some cases we have what we what ha, what we like to call around here pay to not suck. <sighs> it's a depressing prospect. On the other hand, you could have the AD and D elf who was on who was in the exact opposite camp, or the th or the third edition Godzilla. There's always a there's always an extreme people, and we're trying to get close to feeling as OP as an extreme without actually being an extreme. Whereas, people like to feel powerful. Mm -hmm. Whereas the whereas um with this one, somebody could fe somebody could easily dip into spell casting as a field knight, but the strongest spells they're not going to get, and the amount the amount of spell casting that they can do is still going to be reduced and even f even f and um that's this brings me to my other point i look at the way ether charge is presented here as a way to dissuade nova ing yeah it's definitely a, a nova control um but then we come to the important thing that i was coming to next another uh another rule that's actually really cool because remember everybody Veil vale of the Void is not a game that is just played on the material plane. Mm -hmm. You can go to these other realms. And so there's this section next. Casting within a realm. When successfully casting a spell inside of its origin realm, for example, casting an arcane spell in the arcane realm, you do not add a point to the charge state. While in a spell's origin realm, you are manipulating the magic directly from that realm instead of the arcane current. You ignore the charge state, even at 7 plus points, while casting a spell while fully inside its origin realm. So, if your Mechromancer ever goes to the Endscape, the plane of Aether and the Dead, uh, he can throw on his Aether spells all he fucking wants. And that's going to be terrifying. <laughs> You're already in the realm of the dead. I'd say the I'd say the other thing that's that's a count that's a counterweight to to um going Nova in this system is the consequences of botching spells, especially botching superlative spells. <laughs> a twenty-five by twenty-five rift of energy that's going to destroy literally everybody there. Yeah. Last twenty rounds does fifty chaotic damage per round. Yeah, everybody's gonna die. And superlative spells can't be cancelled with that tough arcanting check, like everything else can. So if you botch on a superlative, you're fucked. Of course if you botch on a superlative, everybody else in the twenty five by twenty five area is fucked too. You've killed your party, you've killed the bad guys, you've just killed everybody. When I That's get, all. When I get the chance later on, I should ask Trevor if he was at all inspired by the way Warhammer and Warhammer 40k handle spells and psyker powers, respectively. You mean the whole perils of the warp bullshit? Yes. It kind of feels like it with the botches. It isn't as volatile. But it, but it is, it is still a, it, it is still a case where, and this is, this is always something that I appreciate when it comes to get, when it comes to games that have spell systems, putting in a degree of risk. So, spe so even if you have phenomenal cosmic power, you shouldn't be fucking around with it. Yeah. Now, uh, go ahead. <laughs> And that's very much what I see. What I see with this, I'd say. Um, I mean, you have this. You have you have um, corruption as as it's used in the in some of the Conan RPGs, as well as mm -hmm. things like Blade of the Iron Throne. Mm. But just some, just something to make, just something to make it so that you can't just nu you can't just nuke away. Yeah, there's always there's always a, a, a an upside and a downside, and having to balance risk and reward. Is a mechanic we all really love, actually. Well, I've already I've already mentioned that my favorite SNES shooter was technically Wild Guns. 
<laughs> if you can get the True. remake, do it, people. True. There's a, another couple things here. I'm not actually going to go after the Mystic Arcane spell list because it's a it's a universal spell list that everybody can get, and a lot of it is looks to be um, utility spells. We can go over that some other time when we go over expertises and everything since it's part of that section. But the last couple rules, first of all, Arcanting Attacks. So this deals specifically with Arcanting attack spells, spells that directly attack something. An attack spell's difficulty is based on the target's armor. This attack rolls with plus two bonus dice and ignores the minus one bonus die and plus one spell, spell difficulty from the overcharged effect. So if you're casting a direct attack spell and you're already overcharged at you know, above six, you're at seven plus. You don't have the minus one bonus die and you don't get the plus one spell difficulty. However, if you're at 12, it's still affected by the plus two round cooldown and the dangerous cast effect. Attack spells add your virtue to their damage. So the virtue for casting with our Mecromancer is power. It would add the power virtue to its damage. And then this uh, this final section is interesting. It's titled Unlimited Power! I have to imagine that that's what he was channeling when he wrote that. Um, spellcasters may manipulate their spells to craft something new and encouraged are encouraged to do so. No wizard is ever bound just to their basic spells. Any good mage builds off what they know to create something even better. When casting a spell, you may attempt to change it into something else within boundaries. This could be anything from changing damage type to combining and crafting it with other spells. The GM will then decide a higher difficulty you need to meet when casting. If you succeed, the spell does what you wanted it to do. And there's this example here. Suppose you cast Fire Blast from the Arcane Spell Tree, but you are attacking a Water Elemental. Unfortunately, you have no lightning or earth spells, so you attempt to manipulate the spell. The GM states the difficulty will be hard 4 instead of average 3. On a success, you inflict lightning damage instead of the original fire. Like everything in this game, spells are only limited by your imagination. And like I said, we won't go into the arcane spell list now. That's probably not going to be as, as uh, fun to look at as the specializations and ether spells of the Necromancer. But I love that the, there's even this you can play around with your spells thing. I love that. That's fucking cool. Especially since you know, do you know how many times I've wanted to do a caster themed around a certain element, but I have to take spells that I don't want because of the whole spell list bullshit. Yes. Yes, monk. I am. 170 fucking thousand percent aware of that conundrum, and I fucking hate it! Mm -hmm. Or, it's, for it, for instance, um, suppose, suppose that you're, suppose, th consider, consider, um, let's consider Dark Souls for a moment. And the fact that there is an entire field of magic just around one element. I romancy. If you tried to do a a straight pyromancer in D in D and D, this is not me playing edition wars. This is the problem with any edition. Unless you want to get, unless you want to pull certain types of sorcerers out of, out of your ass or or the like, you're using you're using a preset spell list that is going to have stuff that does not fit what a pyromancer would be casting. You'd have to homebrew your own class with its own homebrewed custom spell list. It would take... A, it wouldn't take as much finagling as other homebrew stuff, but it's still an effort because you have to compile all the fire spells from all around the fucking book. Plus, and... Plus, there's the fact that the, the default fireball spell is a magical grenade. Yeah, it's an explosion, not not not. It is a, it, it is an exploding tiny silver sphere that does fire damage because it's an incendiary grenade. 
It is not the traditional, I conjure a spear that is made of flames in my hand and throw it at you. Mm -hmm. I think that one is actually called Orb of Fire. Yeah. And or Chromatic Orb, if you want to just choose that one to be fire. When it feels like being fire. <laughs> But moving past that, I think it's time we get to the subclasses. Yes, the specializations. I especially look forward to this because it looks really fun. So, the first one that we have is Spirit Commander. You have, master, you have mastered command and control over the undead. Whether the undead are your own creations or that of another, they will follow your command. If not, you will bring their doom. Spirit Commander is unique to the Mechromancer. It is a specialization that cannot be taken outside of the Mechromancer class. Mm -hmm. So, at level 5, you gain... The first thing you get is Death Pact. Your control of the dead grows. You may have six undead under your control at one time. For each undead under your control, you gain plus 2 energy shields, at most 12. You deal plus 5 damage while you have an undead under your control. And consume the dead. Twice per long rest, you may attempt a contested Arcanting versus Mentality check against an undead unit of average plus or lower. On a success, inflict 20% of their max HP in damage and gain one soul essence. So you're both an undead controller and an anti-undead shock trooper. I like it! All y'all follow me. Hey, you, fucker over there, give me your soul. At level <laughs> 10, you gain soul consumption. Whenever beings you control are killed or dismissed, you regain half the essence used to summon them. You now gain plus one additional soul essence when a creature dies. And these souls do not dissipate over time. I think that's a, um, that's a carryover, isn't it? I s oh, I'm still looking at the old version. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My bad. Um, that that was a sentence that was in the older version that uh, Trevor actually took out. Uh, we actually have a changelog that shows he took it out because souls never dissipated in the first place. Mm -hmm. My bad. <laughs> at level 15, you gain unstoppable will. You may attempt to gain control of an average or strong un level undead or corrupted creatures near you. You perform a contested power mentality check against your target. If you win, you gain control of that creature for one hour. After the hour, the creature dies. This may be attempted once per unit per combat. Very nice. You! You're mine now! Yes, master. Hour later... <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> but... Wait a minute, hold on, hold, hold on. Does that stack with soul consumption? If you're controlling it and it dies, whenever beings you control are killed or dismissed, you regain half the essence used to summon them. But you didn't summon it, you just took control of it. Would you still get more soul essence because it died? I, I mean, it's average or strong, so you only you still get the number of soul essence you normally would. Plus one, plus one, because remember, soul consumption said you gain plus additional, one additional plus one essence. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think you're still getting the additional essence, but as far as far as as far as regaining essence when it's when it's killed, that you don't do. Yeah. Okay. Still, an in, in, interesting uh, synergy would have been there if it had. Mm -hmm. Um, and at. Level 20, you gain Spirit Master. You gain an additional attack action to use <coughs> while you have an undead under your control. You now gain the special undead sum summon, Death Knight. The Death Knight may be summoned and dismissed freely, but if it dies, it goes into cooldown for three hours. So I like, the, I like this Death Knight card. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's corrupted, endscape, ether, undead, strong. 
Uh, its, its virtues are power 7, finesse 6, vitality 8, uh, mentality 4, judgment 4, uh, charisma 3. Uh, heavy armor, 350 HP, move of 15 squares, 2 attacks with a cursed plasma sword. Um, expertise is of covert 3, defense 3, dodge, or skill, excuse me, covert 3, defense 3, dodge 3, muscle 5, and weapons 5. And it's and it's two little specials here. Consuming strike on successful hit, transfer one soul essence to the knight's necrom to the knight's necromancer. If not controlled by a necromancer, heal the death knight or their summoner by twenty uh, by twenty HP instead for a round cooldown. Cursed servant. When the summoner takes damage, the damage may instead be transferred to the death knight. If there is no summoner, the Death Knight may ins instead may transfer 50% of its damage taken to nearby undead. What? <laughs> so if you summon the Death Knight and you take damage, Death Knight, here, you're taking this damage instead. Thanks, Master. I love you. <clears throat> if the also... Death Knight's just an enemy... Mm -hmm. Wow. This is why you kill the ads, people. Burn the ads, burn the boss. 50% mm -hmm. <laughs> so... of its damage to nearby undead. Jesus. <laughs> so next is the Aether Cyst, which is a non-exclusive specialization. Aether Cysts are masters of the hunt, the dark energy of the Aether flooding through them. Consuming the souls within their weapons, the Aether Cyst unleashes the power of death itself on their targets. Sometimes, to kill a monster, you need to become one yourself. No, you didn't listen to Nietzsche, Aether Cyst. You didn't listen to Nietzsche. Take care lest you become the monsters you hunt. You're not supposed to do that. And yet, how many times have we seen... Have we... Um, apparent, I guess Ishinomori never read Nietzsche either. Probably not. I'm pretty sure Ishinomori um, was from the wrong part of the world for that monk. <laughs> and one one would think I'd be bring, one would think I'm bringing up Common Rider or certain Super Sentai. No, I'm bringing up Skull Man. <laughs> Fitting for what we're reading. Mm -hmm. So, at level 5, the first thing you get is Aether Connection. You are no longer affected by ambush rounds. You gain plus 1 bonus level in Observation, Insight, and Hunting slash Tracking. You gain plus 1 bonus level in Power while your weapons are drawn, even if your power is at the max level of 10. You gain an additional 4 spells of your current spell level, and protection to ether damage. I suddenly have an idea of where this is going, but we'll see when we get to the end of it. Mm -hmm. You also gain Memory Hunter. Your connection to the ether realm grants you a super sense and understanding. You may cast Scene Reconstruction with an additional plus one bonus die and gain the expertise Super Sensory. I am a lot. I, I when we get to level twenty, I'll tell you what I'm suspecting. Mm -hmm. At level ten, you gain cursed hunter. You can sense the presence of any ether being within twenty five squares of you. Exa example: undead, etherlings, wraiths, and corrupted. You also sense if ether spells are being used within range. All your attacks now inflict plus power against corrupted. Ether, undead, or large beings. Twice per long rest, you, when an ether spell is cast within 25 squares, you may regain 20% max HP. Um. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At level 15, you gain dead tech which is a exclusive. If you start combat with no soul essence, gain three. You may now draw soul devour weapons 
for a free action during the action phase. Instead of using a rearm action, yeah. And at level 20, you gain Ether Shift. You consume a swirling chemical soul concoction and transform into a terrifying undead beast. You may not cast spells, but your armor is a difficulty higher. You regain 10% max HP each turn, ignoring the daily healing limit. You gain an additional attack action. Once per round, when you take damage, an ether wave blasts from you, inflicting 20 ether damage on all beings within a 5x5 five five area field centered on you. This effect lasts for 5 rounds or until cancelled. It may be used once per long rest. You do not gain essence while in this form. Oh, my idea, at least with the starting stuff, although it took a hard left here at Ether Shift, but it's still kind of within theme, is Undead Necromancer Witcher. That that early stuff, Ether Connection, Memory Hunter, Cursed Hunter, all of that is shit that Witchers do. When they're tracking monsters and killing them. You know what I was thinking... Before you, before I want to get to what I was thinking, um, I want to hear what you, what your thought was when it turned, when it took that left. The ether shift. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> honestly, at that point, uh, it, especially once you said the chemical concoction bit, um, it's still kind of witchery in theme, if not in practice, but. More, more Hugh Jackman's Van Helsing now. You want to know where I? You want to know where I'm leaning? Where's that? Two words: prey oh. slaughtered. <sighs> God damn it, monk! Is it I not? Is it, it not? The is it not the hunter from Bloodborne? It is, and and it, which is of course itself somewhat inspired by a little bit of Witcher as, as well. But yes, it, it is. Mm -hmm. But. <laughs> I mean, gr granted, you, granted, you don't tra you don't um, you don't do the big a you don't do the big ass transformation in Bloodborne, but that's because that's you. That would be you losing all of your insight and, tur and turning to the beast. Mm -hmm. But at the at the same t at the same time, I I um I wouldn't be surprised if a beast transformation was considered early on but was dropped. Mm -mm. I don't have any proof of that, honest, obviously, but I could I could easily see that. And hell, there was the whole thing with Caleb in Blood that where he was he was supposed to have a monster form, but you but it got dropped. Yeah. <clears throat> Probably because it was too it was too difficult to work with because the build engine is moody. That's one way of putting it. Mm-hmm. But our third specialization is Wraith Lord. Wraith Lord's souls are split in two, beings of both life's warmth and the cold touch of death. Inspiring fear through their ghastly duality, they specialize in multiple attacks that inflict massive amounts of damage. And at fifth level, the first thing you get is Wraith Strike. Your wraith soul manifests in an uneasy aura. Anytime you perform an attack or attack spell successfully, your wraith performs that same attack or spell. Its attacks and spells automatically hit and inflict half damage. If a single attack inflicts multiple damage instances, the wrath the why do I see wrath? The wraith may only inflict up to two of those damage instances. If your attack or spell critically succeeded, the wraith does full damage instead. So now we've now we've got the reaper, mm -hmm. the fourteen reaper. Yep. 
You also gain Soul Deflect. You gain an additional reaction for your Wraith to deflect. If your Wraith successfully deflects, you may perform an attack. Your Wraith may not copy this attack. It's a parry and repost. Mm -hmm. That's nice. I like that. At 10th level, you gain Grave Chill. You may perform a contested intimidation check against the target within five squares as an extra action. If you succeed, the target runs up to their full movement away from you. This triggers reactionary strikes. <laughs> so you have Rebuke. It's any target, though. It's not just undead. It's just, I'm going to intimidate you and you're going to run away. Yep. You also gain None Escape Death. Whenever you successfully land a reactionary strike, your wraith may attack the target. <laughs> At level 15, you gain Soul Split. Twice per short rest as an action, make a copy of your wraith soul for three rounds. This form may teleport immediately to an adversary within two times max movement and perform an attack that deals your weapon's attack damage. You may teleport to your copy for free. The copy may attack once per round. That's, um... You teleport the copy to attack something, and then you teleport to it to attack again. And at level 20, <clears throat> you gain Wraith Commander. Once per short rest, you may summon a Wraith to serve you. It does not require your blood every day. Its stats are that of the Wraith's adversary chart below. You may swap between your summoned Wraith as an extra action each turn. It lasts for three hours. Let's see. Nice. Wraiths are ethereal, humanoid, undead, and average. Medium armor, 75 HP, 5 move. Wraith wrappings do 2d6 force damage. They're, they're a ranged attack of 8 squares and 15 squares. Yep. See. Um, there are two main abilities. Heart Grasp can perform a contested power vitality check. On a success, stop the target's heart for a moment by reducing their current HP by 10% and restore the race HP by the damage inflicted. This can only affect the same target twice per combat. And Frozen Hearts. Wraiths have, re have resistance to water slash frigid, frigid damage and take plus 5 damage from fire attacks. And then their virtues are Power 6, Finesse 5, Vitality 5, Mentality 3, Judgment 4, and Charisma 2. Finally, we get to the Endscape Ether Spell Tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said when we read the arcane area earlier, there are going to be spells in this that have asterisks that are unique to the Necromancer. But there are going to be spells that don't, which means anyone with Arcanting can take them. Mm -hmm. Which I absolutely love. I'm not sure if we want to focus on, or if we want to explain every spell or not, but it's only a, a few pages. I think we should summarize. The, I think we should summarize the spells instead of going into detail for each of them. Um, okay. Before before I do though, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the Wraith Lord is non-exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. So the, imagine <laughs> a field knight Wraith Lord. Um. I mean, you it, none of the none of the Wraith Lord stuff uses. Uh, soul charges, so it'd be one of the best ones to take. It'd also be the stuff of nightmares, given the given the whole thing with um, field knights charging and dragging enemies around with their rocket lawn chairs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but oh. start off with novice. And the first spell we see is Ether Chime, which is ba which is basic basically a way basically a way to scare the shit out of people near you. Yep, and it's unique to the Necromancer. Mm -hmm. 
um, it it you're you're essentially uh, holding it for four rounds, and uh, all adversar- adversaries within ten squares of you must perform a contested arcanting vitality check. On failure, they take two, three, four, or sixty-six ether damage and gain the fear condition, depending on whether you cast it as a novice, apprentice, adept, or magus level spell. You get access to it at novice, but apparently you can cast things as higher level spells. Let's see, you also gain ether launcher. Non-unique. Mm-hmm. Anybody can take this one if they're a spell if they're a spellcaster. It's a fucking an ether. It's rocket. an ether rocket launcher. <laughs> yes. It, it deals two, three, four, or eight d six ether damage, and then it explodes, dealing one, two, three, or four d six ether damage to all adjacent beings. Mm-hmm. You hit one, and it splash damages everything else around it. Oh, Doom Guy would love this. Especially since you summon it from the power of death itself. And again, there are plenty of skulls on the rocket launcher in Doom Eternal. <laughs> this is true. Oh. And we have Grasp of Undeath. It's a line spell. It's a it's a it's a line spell that it that is that is give that is catching hands. Oh no! It's so it's a distant spell that creates a line. I should say. So, wall of hands. Yep. Form. So, everybody's got to take a contested arcanting dodge, and on a failure, 1, 2, 3, or 5d6 plus power in ether damage. On success, half damage. And then, whether they succeed or fail, movement is halved as the hands claw at them. It's nice! I like it! Grasp of Undeath is also uh, non-unique. So... So next we have Haunt, which causes something ether related to happen, such as a haunting scream and the, and the like. It is it is very much a narrative spell. Um, yeah, which is why it has difficulty none and uh, no cooldown. Mm-hmm. Which me, which again, remember what I read in the in the rules earlier: difficulty none, cooldown cool none. You don't get charge uh, charge points from it. So this you could use this to do fluffy narrative things without getting ether charge points. Yeah, make pe- maybe make people think they're hearing the- they're hearing voices. Mostly because they are. Yep. Ether related, you know, screams, slamming doors, apparitions, ghostly glows. Says you can't have three then more of these active at one time. Basically, you turn yourself into a haunted house, or what? Or what the lighting looks like whenever a deadite shows up. Heh. <laughs> See, next is ne- preserve the next is preserve the dead. Can only be used out of content, uh, com- combat, and it it's basically pre- it's not too far removed from preserve dead in D anD. d Yep, you put the body in stasis. The body can't have been dead for more than an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, but during the time that the do- the body is preserved, it can't rot or wither, and it can be resurrected if you can find someone capable. Um, after the duration, the body turns to ash. Uh, and the duration is 8, 10, 12, or 14 hours, depending on whether it was cast as a novice apprentice adept or magus spell. Or Magus, 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 Magus. Mm-hmm. Um, next we have Soul Feed, which is an exclusive. Nope. You're devour- well, That's why your devouring weapons are in- involved. Mm-hmm. You can feed one essence into your weapon, your melee, and you get and you get some um, extended melee range. And it's and it's dam its damage is incre- its damage is increased by one two fo- one two three or four d six. Ranged weapons get even more range and deal an additional six damage. And you can reroll one of the one of the ranged weapons failed attacks for three rounds. 
That's nice! Mm -hmm. You feed one essence into your weapon, and now you can do more shit with it. That's nice! I like that! Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see. Summon Spirit does exactly what you think it would. And while well, active, you get one bonus level in Intimidation. And, well, it actually doesn't do what people might think it would do. It doesn't. It doesn't attack or speak, but it performs simple tasks. Familiar. Yeah. It it, it can't even cast magic through it, so it's not even a familiar. Uh, then we have Wraith's summons, which is unique. Yep. Choose. Choose one. Choose one or two squares. Two if two if it's a mag, if it's a magus spell, and one and one to two wraiths answer the call. They appear in the and they appear in the square of choice and follow your commands. They have the standard wraith stats. They must either kill something once per hour or you must give them your life force to satiate them. If you choose the latter, you lose ten h ten HP per per wrath for thirty per thirty minutes. They will turn on and you if not fed. You lose... Is it just 10 HP or 10 max HP? 10 max HP. Yeah. And when they mm -hmm. turn on you, they gain a free attack against you and then disappear back to their realm. Yep, this may be cancelled before the duration ends, releasing the wraiths. And so this is why in the Wraith Commander feature for the Wraith Lord, it says you don't have to feed it blood. But it's only for that one. So yeah. using this spell, it wouldn't count. Yes. That's why I said it's specific to the Wraith Commander feature. Let's see. At Apprentice level, first thing we see is Dark Strike. Strike at your foes with the full force of Enscape. You summon Arcanatech swords to strike all adversaries around you. Why am I getting Darksiders flashbacks? We don't have Mark Hamill on hand. I mean, we don't have uh, Liam O'Brien on hand either, but this is definitely War's Wrath uh, ability that causes all the swords to shoot up from the ground. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See, then we have Ethereal Hand. Well, hold on. There was additional stuff there. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there was. Um, regardless of successful hit, they're with Dark Strike, they're branded with Death's Mark, which curses all hit targets with minus two bonus die in their next check. There you go. Yeah. And the range goes five by five, seven by seven, nine by nine, whether you cast it as an apprentice, adept, or magus level spell. It's non-unique as well, so uh, anybody can take it. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then Ethereal Hand. It's a Mage Hand. Is that you? It's the hand from the Adams family. <gasps> no. no, it's, it's a hand to make you cast spells when all your hands are full. So now you can so you do this and you can cast spells and use that great weapon. Novice, apprentice, or adept level once every two rounds. That's fucking great. Oh man, I love it. And I'd say eth I'd say ethereal hand is going to be useful for any caster. Yeah, I could see any caster taking it. Doubly honestly, so any gish caster. Oh, yeah. I'm wielding this giant greatsword, and I need to cast an adept level spell. Fuck you, here's my ethereal hand to cast it for me. Um, I could also reference Scanlan's hand from Vox Machina. Or Scanlan's dick lightning. <laughs> we'll get to that in a couple weeks. <laughs> um... Let's see, then, ex then um, Exploding Minion. A self-destruct feature isn't necessary, but can be quite entertaining. <laughs> I read that, and I was like, God damn it, Trevor. <laughs> Sacrifice a minion. If done, it explodes in a four-square cone in front of the minion. Any being standing in the cone area is inflicted with acidic damage of two, three, to f 
or five d five d six plus five and gains poison. And let's not forget that um, that would technically that would technically count as a de as a death for for um for something you summoned. Yep. So that would that would uh, that would affect some of the subclass features we saw. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I the soul I consumption love, I spirit commander. When there's, when there's interplay with these kind of things, it gives me so many ideas. It does, especially since exploding minion is a unique, so it's only for the necromancer. Mm -hmm. So, then our next one is Reap the Soul. A soul reaper, if you will. You rip one, two, th one, two or three soul essence from, it, from a target. If used while you have max souls, instead inflict additional ether damage based on, based on, based on its level 4, 5, or 76 plus power. Usable on the same target twice per day. Man, another unique as well because of the soul essence stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and summon Mecha Ripper. Form a contract with the d with using your creation cube. You infuse it with the essence of a Ripper. It glows and then takes the form of a Mecha Ripper adversary. When cast at Magus level, the Mecha Ripper has 25 HP and adds your power to its damage on the Metal Claw attack. Um, let me see for a second. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Trying to find the Mecha Ripper myself. <laughs> But you know, it's not it's not like you don't have enough minions as it is. Yeah. Yeah. But moving right along to Adept. Choir of Terror. <laughs> oh, so watching Sister Act. This is also non unique, so anyone can take it. Mm -hmm. Summon a choir of the forgotten that haunt your target for the duration, inflicting ether damage per round, either fifteen or twenty-five. The target has to contest a arcanet has to perform a contested arcanting balance check against you. If they fail, they are knocked prone and cannot remove the prone effect until it ends or two rounds pass, whichever comes first. Mm. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so you're just haunting somebody at this point. You are literally just haunting them. Mm -hmm. You are Nappa. Vegeta. <laughs> Vegeta. I'm haunting you. No! Let's see, next is Consume Potential. What what once was yours is now mine. Or what was once yours is now mine. You steal virtues. Is this permanent? No. There's no there's no indication of it going away. Um six rounds. Uh true. Still six rounds of st six rounds of stealing someone. This is a case. Congratulations, my friend. We found a way to do ability drain in a way that doesn't suck ass. It reduces their primary virtue by one and adds plus one to a virtue of your choice. And at Magus level, it reduces their virtue by two. Mm -hmm. So if you steal their best virtue, because that's what it is, their primary virtue. You can add it to any one of your virtues. I would add it to power, since that's what the Necromancer uses for our canting. Um, one question that I do have with Consume Potential, though. How is it against the cap? 
Ooh, that's a good point. What if it, you hit the 10 point cap? Mm -hmm. I'd assume that it do, I'd assume that it doesn't factor the cap in, but I think that's something that should something that should be made clear. Yeah, since it's temporary, mm -hmm. it might not factor the cap after all. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Then we have Death's Embrace, which is a unique in you wrap yourself in a veil of ether. In this form, you gain the effects of the ethereal form ability of the exiled species. You, and if we remember that... You cannot affect items with this ability. If used in combat, you ignore one reaction strike per round. Once per round, when you move through an enemy, you may inflict 15 or 30 ether damage. And to recap ethereal form, since it has been a little while since we covered the species. Mm -hmm. You may transform yourself and all items you are wearing into your ethereal form at will. Of course, with the spell, you're doing the same thing. In this form, you may move through adversaries and objects, including walls. You cannot end your, turn, your, your movement inside an object or unit. This form lasts and can be switched between for up to an hour, after which it goes into a cooldown for two hours. You cannot move through something that prevents ether abilities. While in this form, anything with the ether workings expertise rolls with plus one bonus dice on attacks. So, a little bit of a breakdown there for that particular spell. Mm -hmm. But you cannot affect items, it said, as, as we saw. Yep. Then we get to Magus level, and the first one is Ball of Annihilation. Frieza, oh. is that you? Let's see. It's a it is a field of uh, is a five by five field within twenty squares. All beings within the field take forty pure damage and gain fear. The GM then moves the field five squares in a random direction. Anything hit by the field suffers the damage and negative effect. I'm sensing a Seems bit of like... a I'm sensing a bit of a theme when it comes to the Macromancer in that they really do not believe in collateral damage. Well, that seems to be anything with ether relation because this one's not unique. Mm -hmm. Let's see then, Duel of the Dying. Why am I here? Why am I hearing Duel of the Fates? You too. You and the attacker are encased in hardened ether essence and, immu and immune to all outside damage and cannot be healed. You both lose any actions and share the same initiative for the duration. Each round, you you and the attacker perform a contested arcanting power check. The winner of that round deals three times power in physical damage to the loser. The spell ends after four rounds or when one of the individuals are knocked unconscious. Can't we just get beyond Thunderdome? That's why the range on this is touch. Mm -hmm. But still, two men enter, one man leaves. You know, in this case, it's a little more literal, Monk. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's non-exclusive, so that'll be interesting. For, I wouldn't exactly go with it for, for a Gish Field Knight, but it'd be interesting for some other builds. Ish combat medic. Mm -hmm. All that damage you're dealing now coming back in HP pool. Oh. See, then we have one foot in the grave. Unleash the claws of ravenous um, bloodlers. All adversaries within the area field take four times power in slashing damage. They must then perform a arcanting power check contested. On a failure, they are grasped for two rounds and inflicted with bleeding six. And it's a range of 11 by 11 centered on self. Mm -hmm. But then we get to the, the section I like most, superlative spells. And remember, superlative spells are unique to the casting class of that tree. So the superlative spells for Aether are unique to Mechromancers. Uh, there's a bit of a rule here. You may only cast two of your superlative spells a day and each spell may only be cast once per day they've got three total 
superlative spells, so you can cast any two of those per day. Mm-hmm. All superlative spells have a challenging six difficulty. So, but these are all unique to the Mechromancer, so yep. we don't need to mention otherwise. Mm-hmm. First one is Consume the Living, which is a 15 <laughs> by 15 range focused on yourself. Consume the life force of all living things other than yourself within the field. When you perform this spell, you fin- you inflict ether damage equal to half your current HP to anything living within the field. Every weapon you have fills refills up to half their max souls. Oh. Hmm. If they're already at half their max souls and you do this, do you get the buff up to all their max souls? I want to know this. Mm-hmm. Well, it does says refills up to half their half their max. So that's certainly a possibility. Be nice. Granted, you, granted, it do, granted, this does mean you just blew both of your superlative spells to do that. Actually, no. You, or actually, no. Never mind. Because remember, each of these can only be cast once per day. Yeah, but what if your weapons already have half charges in them from other encounters, and you choose to do this? And you succeed, obviously. Successful yeah. spellcast. <laughs> um. I don't know which is my favorite, but I think it might be Shatter the Veil, to be honest. Shat, which, that's a good one. That's a good time to go into that one. So, <laughs> the range is one, is one mile by one mile. I just like the description, though. Slice a rune of shattering through the sky and bathe in the darkness of ether. A ethereal field flows over the realm immediately, inflicting 50 ether damage on all living beings in the field. The unnatural darkness is treated as being pitch black, and all beings other than yourself are supernaturally blinded. While covered in darkness, all gravity is 50% less, and all successful attacks inflict an additional 15 ether damage. I could totally see someone casting, saying, just before they cast this, you're not afraid of the dark, are you? Okay, okay, Riddick, okay. No, see, this is, this is, this is the perfect fucking spell for that moment where you see an army and you go, Slay all. It's the perfect moment for Judgment Cut End. Fuck you all. (laughs) Oh. And of course, of course, of course, the other the other thing that comes to mind is a line, f- a uh, one of the be- one of the better lines that Darth Vader has been given in any of the Star Wars comics. All I'm <laughs> surrounded by is fear and dead men. <laughs> and the third the third superlative is unleash the malefic. Summoning a Malefic Devourer. A 3x3 three three Malefic Devourer adversary spawns in the Chosen Square, um, within 20 squares of you. The creature follows your demands, com- commands and cannot harm you. After 5 rounds, the monstrosity leaves the field. Let's see. Enscape, Aether, Mecha, Undead, Strong, Light Armor, 300 HP, 10 movement, 2 attacks... Either an Ether Cannon with 2040 range, dealing 3d6 plus 5 damage, or Blade Claws, which deal 18 damage. Uh, power 6, Finesse 8, Vital- Vitality 6, Menta- Mentality 5, Judgment 4, Charisma 1. Then we get to its abilities. Fear um, Blast. First eight. its skills. Okay. Our Canting 4. It can cast spells, Monk! This thing can fucking cast spells! Defense 3, Hunting 4, Intimidation 3, and Weapons 6. Yeah. So, you have, you, the options you have are Fear Blast, the Aether Cannon Attack is a 5x5 five five AoE and inflicts the Fear Condition. <laughs> wait, wait, is, is that just additional to the Aether Cannon being a 2040 range with 3d6 plus 5 damage? I think it is. And you get to do that twice. (laughs) Um, Behemoth. Malefic Devourers stand 12 feet tall in our 3x3 model. Six-legged. 
It walks on six sharpened blade legs. It automatically passes balance checks of difficulty tough and lower. When it walks over a, 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 uni a unit smaller than it, it may attack them for free with its legs using the weapon skill. If the attack hits, the target takes 10 damage and build and bleed 3. This last skill is my favorite part of the Malefic Devourer, by the way. Devour. When non-Ether Magic is cast, the Devourer may perform a contested Arcanting check as a reaction. On a success, the spell fails and the Devourer heals 20 HP. It's... It is an anti-magic weapon, monk. An anti you use this against any other mage. Pretty much. I cast Fireball. My Devourer says no. You want to know what would make this even worse? A battle between two high-level mages, one of them a Necromancer, one of them any other um, caster. And that other one decides as, as a motive of as a desperation move to cast one of their superlatives. And you perform the contest at our canting check and uh and win. <laughs> you may you do it from you do it from far away. Just keep just you know... keep the devourer just keep the devourer close and when he get and when he gets desperate and casts that superlative, you win. Yeah, the devourer the devourer is going to get fucked, but by that, but um, the enemy's still dead. Monk, I I don't know why I'm seeing this in my head. A conclave of ten necromancers against an army. One casts Shatter the Veil. The other nine cast Malefic Devourers in various areas of the battlefield. They're the only ones they, that can see, so they can command the Malefic Devourers easily. Mm -hmm. Everything's taking 50 damage, including the Devourers. I mean, they have to. Wait, are they living? or No, they're undead, so they take no damage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... <laughs> That's just ridiculous, but it sounds so cool. I can see why Trevor was excited for us to tackle the Mecromancer. I can too, and it's very clear that the art at the end of the Necromancer chapter is the Wraith Lord. Mm -hmm. But this this is a fun class. I like this class. Very happy about this class. Um, and it it's I am still get, the strongest vibe that I am still getting is the Dark Elf Shadow Knight from Champions of Morath and Champions Return to Arms. Yeah, as an as a necromancer, as as a casting class that has a side of minions to it, those are some pretty fun minions. Even the infested are useful. Oh yeah. Even if even if you just cast <laughs> help the <this> truck, <laughs> fucking self destruct. <laughs> but unless I'm mistaken, there were more non exclusive. Spells for spells for and for um ether, then there are exclusive ones. I think so. In novice, there's one, two, three, three exclusive spells for novice. Mm -hmm. In apprentice, there's three exclusive spells. In adept, there's one. In magus, there's none. And then the superlatives are always exclusive. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, the exclusive spells are, are a smaller section of the overall tree, because the tree still needs to be open to people who want to cast an Aether spell here or there. Um, yes, there's special stuff for if you're taking a Mecromancer, which is cool. You always want there to be special stuff for taking the class. Mm -hmm. But it isn't so... Um, OP that... You're going to say, say, well, if I want to cast Aether Spells, I should just be a Mecromancer no matter what, because it's going to suck otherwise. Mm -hmm. The only thing you don't get by being a Mecromancer at the Aether Tree, beyond the stuff that, like, Exploding Minion is tied to the Minion feature for the Mecromancer. Mm -hmm. The Superlative Spells are really the ones that, if you, you look at a Superlative Spell in a list somewhere, and you're like, I really like those spells. I want to cast those ones specifically at some point. 
that's why you're going to choose a casting class if you're choosing based just on spells. Which, I'm going to be honest, no one should do that. Don't choose just based on the spells. Look at the class, look at its features, look at its specializations, look at the things it can do. The spells are part of that. And yes, these superlative spells are fucking cool. But don't choose Necromancer just because you like the superlative spells. Because you may not like the rest of the way the class plays. And that's one hell of an ass to, for something you're going to get at the capstone. Yes, superlative spells are your level 20. When you get to level 20, that's when you get to cast them. But before then, you're going through the rest of the, the tree. You get some of the uniques, and you, of course you get any of the ones that are non-unique. Mm -hmm. But... You're not going to. You're not going to. Enjoy, if you're not going to enjoy the class for all the other stuff it has, then getting the superlative spells is just going to be a chore. Mm -hmm. and you don't want that. And something. Something else is that you'll notice. You'll. I notice that within this. The amount of the amount of sp the amount of spells is nowhere near as excessive as the spell list we see in we see in certain other games. Yeah, and it's not as small as the spell list in say Shadowrun, but there's a reason the spell list is small in Shadowrun. Mm -hmm. But the the fact that the fact that there's not that there isn't a massive a massive ass spell list like we see like we see in the bigger names, um, makes me makes me smile for the for the simple fact that you don't have the problem of cat of as Tanner pointed out casters having more getting more game out of the game. Yeah. Now, uh. Something something I noticed was there are t there are two separate notations, one on the the chart and one in the actual features of when you get additional spells. Mm -hmm. um, when you start, you get four four novice spells and two spells from the mystic spell tree, uh, and then you can learn the unique spells from the ether tree because you're the necromancer. On the chart, we see a, 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 col a column that says spell, and it shows a plus one every so often. Mm -hmm. There's eight of them there. So if, it's, if that's one additional spell at each of those levels, that's eight additional spells all the way up until 20th level, which is a total of 12 spells for the novice that you get at character creation, eight additionals. But each time you got spell upgrade, you'd also get an additional spell. And so if that's the if that's the 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 case as well, you get the the plus is seen in the column and the additional spell at every spell upgrade. That means you get another additional spell at apprentice, another additional spell at adept, another additional spell at magus, and uh, then you just gain access to superlative spells. So that's a total of fifteen spells that you get to learn, I think. If I'm reading all of this correctly, um, if Trevor would like to correct me, please do. I'm always happy to know the rules better than I know them now. Mm -hmm. But that's essentially what I'm reading. And 15 spells out of a spell list that is... there's It looks like there's seven spells to pick from in Novice. When, or No, eight spells to pick from in Novice when you first start. So you get half of those at character creation. And then apprentice spells, there's another five, looks like, yeah. Adept spells, there's another three. Magus spells, there's another three. And then superlative spells, there's another three. So there's a total here of 22 spells. 22 ether spells. That's small. That's insanely small compared to other spell lists we've seen in other games. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all f really unique, really fun. Some are just for the fuck of it, like Haunt. <laughs> and so you get, out of the, out of all your leveling up and stuff, you get to choose a majority of these. You're not, you're, 
you're not going to get seven of them. There's 22 here, and you're only not going to get seven of them. For, for example, if you're playing, say, uh, a Wraith Lord, you may ignore Wraith Summons just because you've got a Wraith already. Or you're going to get a Wraith already. Mm -hmm. And you don't really need more Wraiths. Uh, and you're not dealing with... with uh, maybe, maybe you don't care about Haunt or Preserve the Dead. And so you ignore those. Um, Wraith Lord doesn't use a lot of, of soul power. So you can get something like Soul Feed to use your soul essence for other things. Um, like, hit, like hitting the nuke button. <laughs> exactly. And uh, that's the well. One thing that I did. One thing that I did notice with a lot of a lot of stuff with the Wraith Lord. They're not exactly precise. No, no, they are definitely the guys who slay all. Shatter, shatter, shatter the void would definitely be a, or shatter the veil would definitely be something I, I could see a Wraith Lord having. I put you all in darkness, me and my wraith teleport around this one mile battlefield killing you all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's one of those situations where I don't think you'll have analysis paralysis coming up. You'll you'll come up with a clear idea of the character you want to play creating a mechromancer. You'll probably already have an idea of, you know, what you want to get from your your specializations, what you want to get from your spell list. Maybe you'll have a change of heart as you go down the line. Maybe things will change as you play through a campaign. Um, and you'll, you know, you'll choose other things as you go. But I don't think anyone's going to suffer the analysis paralysis you normally do at spell lists. Mm -hmm. Or, in some cases, the non-analysis paralysis that at spell lists because you know that there are only three spells worth of fucking damn and everything else can die. Yes, we are still bitter. Because we are petty motherfuckers here. We're petty motherfuckers, but we've got a goddamn point. I do not need 17 versions of the same fucking spell with different flavors. What, don't you want one more version of Soul Arrow? No, Monk. I don't want one more version of Soul Arrow. I also don't want one more version of Prestidigitation. Which is a fucking cantrip. But we for next week we will be continuing. I'd I'd say for the next two weeks we'll be continuing um, our dip into casters. Yeah, the uh, next caster. Um, actually, really, I don't know how this is going to turn out. Monk, I don't. But I like the uh, the fucking idea. Mm -hmm. Also, why doesn't it have superlative spells? What? We'll get to I'm that a... in seven days. I'm sad now. <laughs> or a week, whichever comes first. Seven days or a week, whichever comes first. Yeah, that's a good idea. And of of course, of course, there's a few other surprises coming coming down the pipe, including some ver some very interesting interviews and something that I planned to do for last week, but outside factors got in the way. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>